Hello, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to uh, PHO webinar presentation. Uh, today's session is uh, four out of a series of six webinars, orientation for IPAC leads in long-term care. And uh, subject for today's session is reprocessing. My name is Boris Marufov, and I am team lead at IPAC PHO, and I will be moderating this session today with you. Before we begin uh, today's presentation, I will mention a few housekeeping items. Uh, and one is the chat pod has been disabled to limit any distractions during the presentation. Please use a Q&A pod if you have any questions during the session. A discussion and a question period will follow the presentation at the end. Uh, presentation slides and the recordings will be made available in two, three weeks after uh, today's session. Uh, recordings of the first and the second session uh, actually is available online on PHO website. You can go and check it out. And uh, if at any point during the session you have uh, you experience any technical issues, please email capacitybuilding at oahpp.ca. And with that, let me um, introduce today's uh, presenters. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Sarah Eden, who is um, who received her uh, BSc uh, on, in nursing from Laurentian University and completed additional courses in epidemiology and infection control. She has obtained her CIC designation and has recertified from Certification Board of Infection Control and Epidemiology. She has worked as a research assistant and infection control practitioner at large academic acute care hospital. Sarah joined the regional infection control networks in, back in 2008, and since then worked as a network coordinator, acting regional infection control networks manager, and now as a regional infection uh, prevention and control specialist at Public Health Ontario. Our second presenter, uh, you also uh, might be familiar with from previous sessions, Tanya Denich, who has been an infection control practitioner since 2007. Tanya holds a Bachelor uh, in, of Science from the University of Waterloo and Master degree from, uh, in Microbiology from the University of Guelph. Tanya uh, was the IPAC team lead in emergency department, operating room, medical device processing. And Tanya uh, has also been the IPAC lead for a variety of programs in the past, including maternal, child, complex care, and critical care in a hospital setting. And with that, uh, I will now ask Sarah to, be, to begin the presentation for, for today. Hi, thank you, Boyce, and uh, welcome, everyone. Okay, the learning objective for today's session. Uh, by the end of this module, you will be able to explain the key principles for reprocessing of medical equipment and devices, apply Spalding's classification of medical devices to determine the level of reprocessing necessary, and also describe quality control measures for safe and effective reprocessing. So this is your orientation. It will not be a full reprocessing training or education course, but it will give you a great start for understanding some of these uh, key principles and concepts related to reprocessing. Here's our agenda for today. So we will briefly uh, mention again the IPAC uh, checklist and orientation uh, resources for new IPAC leads. The majority of the session will be discussing reprocessing, what we're here for, and then we will have some time for questions and answers, uh, as well as a bit of a wrap up at the end. Okay, so if you have attended previous sessions, you may have seen this slide before about the uh, orientation uh, checklist for IPAC leads in long term care. So we are working on a new web page that will have this checklist, as well as resources for you, it will have uh, the series of presentations, like the one you're participating in today. And uh, this will hopefully serve as a roadmap to help guide you and some of your ongoing professional development activities. Uh, within uh, your orientation and ongoing development as an IPAC lead. So a 
as a first step for the reprocessing of medical equipment and devices, you do need to be aware of the activities and the equipment that is being used in your home and what and how is being reprocessed. And I would also say that uh, being aware of what is being done will require some ongoing effort as equipment and processes may change over time. So that will bring us into a bit of discussion about reprocessing standards. So the role of the IPAC lead in reprocessing, it will vary according to your setting. However, the principle of reprocessing is that residents expect medical equipment or devices uh, used or involved in their care to not cause them any harm. And it's easy to inappropriately reprocess medical device, leaving behind microorganisms or that could be capable of causing infection. So in order to protect residents, there really are rigorous uh, standards that must be followed for all medical device reprocessing. All equipment must be reprocessed according to the manufacturer's instructions for use, uh, standards, guidelines, organizational policies and procedures, and this is regardless of the care setting. So you do want to think about uh, Canadian Standards Association in terms of standards, Public Health Agency of Canada and Health Canada guidelines, as well as PIDAC uh, best practice guidelines related to reprocessing. And it is important to note that those manufacturer's instructions for use are the minimum. Uh, so if there are differences between the manufacturer's instructions for use and other uh, standards, you do want to ensure that you are process, reprocessing up to uh, the level that would be expected uh, in any sort of standards or guidelines if there is a discrepancy there. So. We have a couple of goals of medical device reprocessing, and I think I would like to say that the goals of reprocessing uh, really do apply for any reprocessing that is done within your facility, but also the facility is responsible for any medical devices that are used to provide care in the facility, such as dental equipment or external provider foot care equipment, physician's personal equipment. So any equipment or devices that are used uh, really do need to meet these goals. So we want to prevent transmission of microorganisms to personnel, clients, patients, and residents, and also minimize the damage to medical equipment and devices from foreign material, such as blood, body fluids, uh, saline, medications, or inappropriate handling. And I think this is a consideration as many items of medical equipment or devices can be delicate, they can be easily damaged, costly to repair or replace, and they do need to be operationally uh, functioning properly in order to not cause additional risk. So those are the main concepts and goals you want to keep in mind, preventing transmission and ensuring they are functioning properly. Staff education is another key principle, and it's really important regardless of setting. So uh, you will see an image on this slide with our uh, Provincial Infectious Disease Advisory Committee or PIDAC document related to reprocessing. It's linked at the bottom, and the top bullet point has a quote. All staff involved in reprocessing of medical equipment devices must be supervised and shall be qualified through education in a formally recognized course for sterilization technology, training experience in the functions they perform. Uh, so it is important to determine which staff will be carrying out uh, reprocessing and ensuring that they do have the appropriate uh, education and training to do that task. So in a hospital type setting, there are entire departments of staff who are trained and have a sole responsibility for reprocessing of medical devices. Uh, but this statement continues to be uh, relevant and important in non-acute care settings because you may have staff that have other responsibilities. Very often it might be a physical nursing or clinical staff. However, regardless of the setting or how many devices are being reprocessed, the statement still applies that the staff who are involved in reprocessing need to have education and training to be able to conduct that uh, activity according to standards. And we do have uh, an appendix in the PIDAC document that does have some additional detail and provides a list of resources for training in reprocessing. 
So considerations for reprocessing. Uh, you might be involved in uh, purchasing of equipment, or you might be doing some assessment and becoming more familiar with the equipment that's used and what might be reprocessed in your facility. So you may have uh, equipment that is single use equipment, and you may have other equipment or devices that are multiple use uh, medical devices. The image on this slide is a label. So when you do see that uh, two with the line through it, that label indicates that it is a single use item. Um, so that is an item that should not be reprocessed or reused. Uh, the manufacturer will not have instructions for reprocessing and that must be disposed of after use. Uh, you may have other pieces of equipment that uh, can be reprocessed, in which case there will be uh, additional information about how that must be reprocessed. So if we're thinking about uh, reusable medical equipment that is being uh, reprocessed, there needs to be a lot of additional information when those uh, manufacturers are developing the instructions for reprocessing. So there are studies that need to be done to validate that that item can actually uh, be disinfected or sterilized and or sterilized appropriately. And those studies are looked at uh, and validated. Um, and you will see uh, Health Canada is involved in that process. So sometimes a single use device may look similar to something that is being reprocessed uh, or able to be reprocessed. However, you really do need to check the label and make sure if it is something that is single use, even if it looks very sim very similar, it cannot be uh, reprocessed. So it might be tempting, um, but we really have no assurance that that item can be safely reprocessed um, and uh, rendered safe for reuse. So you may be involved in uh, assessing or purchasing considerations about which type of equipment to use. And uh, initially, the single use items may seem more costly. When you are considering cost as one of the factors, you also do need to consider staff time, educational requirements for the equipment, uh, other considerations for safely setting up a reprocessing uh, program or system that will uh, follow standards. So that needs to be part of your consideration as well as uh, the risk that may be uh, coming along with reprocessing. And there could be some additional costs depending on the equipment as well. If it's something that needs to be sterilized, you may have costs related to packaging or wrapping, labeling, as well as additional uh, monitoring, so indicators and uh, monitoring type product, uh, products for the quality assurance. So you do need to uh, think about uh, that in terms of risk, also the possibility of human errors uh, that can result if there is uncertainty about what might be uh, cleaned or sterilized, uh, there are opportunities for errors there. So that should be part of the assessment. So I have mentioned a manufacturer's instructions. So they do need to be available and they need to be available for the staff who are responsible for reprocessing. Uh, so that might be something like a binder in the area where reprocessing is being done. You have all of the manufacturer's instructions or you may have another uh, system. And those manufacturer instructions are considered the minimum standard. And they also need to be periodically checked to make sure they are up to date. Sometimes there may be uh, changes uh, from the manufacturer. And you also want to have uh, someone who is responsible for reviewing those and making sure that there haven't been changes from the manufacturer, any uh, indications or recalls from uh, Health Canada, and you want to just verify that you are doing a periodic review, both of those instructions are available, that they still are applicable, there have been no changes, and that you don't have any outdated instructions for similar equipment, but not specific to the equipment that you might be using. Uh, lastly, in this portion of the presentation, uh, policies and procedures. Uh, so they do need to follow current Public Health Agency of Canada, Health Canada, Canadian Standards Association standards, and PIDAC best practices. And they should be reviewed by someone with infection prevention control expertise. So this may be your IPAC lead. It may be IPAC lead in conjunction with uh, 
uh, your public health, uh, your local public health unit, or it may be uh, partnering with other uh, public uh, or IPAC expertise outside of your organization. Uh, and they should be reviewed annually. In some cases, that could be more often if there has been a change in equipment or uh, processes. And you do want to make sure that the policies and procedures are available in areas where reprocessing is uh, taking place. That same area might be uh, where you would want to have any information related to uh, changes in product, recalls, or any other Health Canada notices, as well as taking that equipment out of service. You might want to ensure that you don't have those outdated uh, policies and procedures for equipment that is no longer being used. Uh, now I'm going to pass it over to Tanya, who will talk a little bit more about determining the level of reprocessing. Thanks for that, Sarah. So yes, we'll move on to that. So really the basis for this, um, determining the level of reprocessing to use would be using the Spalding's classification. So you'll find yourself coming back to this time and time again. Um, this, it really determines um, the device, divides devices into three categories based on the type of contact the device has with the person and the risk of infection. So if you look at the table, there's three classifications. There's critical equipment and devices, there's semi-critical equipment devices, and non-critical. And uh, this for the critical device, this is devices that enter sterile spaces, uh, including the vascular system. And it, for that, for the requirement for those types of devices or equipment, would that be, be uh, cleaning followed by sterilization? So examples of this would be surgical instruments, implants, uh, biopsy instruments, foot care equipment, and eye and dental equipment. With regards to the semi-critical equipment, those are equipment and devices that come in contact with non-intact skin or mucous membranes, but do not penetrate them. So for the requirement for reprocessing for these devices and equipment would be cleaning followed by high-level disinfection at a minimum, although sterilization is uh, preferred. For this type of equipment, you would be looking at respiratory therapy equipment or anesthesia equipment. Uh, for non-critical, equipment and devices. Those are equipment and devices that touch non-intact skin, or sorry, intact skin and mucous membranes, uh, sorry, and not mucous membranes. So they do not touch um, intact, they touch intact skin and not mucous membranes, and they, and they do not directly touch the client resident. Um, they require cleaning followed by low level disinfection and sometimes and in some cases, cleaning is acceptable on its own. So the examples for this were ECG machines, oximeters, um, and uh, bedpans, urinals, and commodes. So we'll come back to the non-critical um, devices, and we're going to go through all these classifications a little more in detail. So moving on to just going a little more in, of a deeper dive into each um, each classification. So critical medical devices, as previously mentioned, are those that enter sterile parts of the body. This includes devices that enter the vascular system. Remember, the blood vessels are sterile spaces along with other sterile spaces in the body. And these items must be cleaned and then sterilized. If the item has multiple pieces, they will have to be taken apart to be cleaned and sterilized separately. Only the end user will be putting that device back together. They really need to be taken apart to be given a thorough clean um, before they can be sterilized. Some examples include foot care equipment, which you see on the slide above, um, surgical instruments, as well as eye equipment. Um, so in this example, again, we're using foot care equipment, and this is covered under the CSA document, the Canadian Standards Association, the Z31418, um, and also under, referenced under the PIDAC best practice document for cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization of medical device and equipment that Sarah mentioned. Um, this classifies foot care equipment as critical because of the risk of nipping skin and breaking skin while providing foot care. So that's the outcome of that device would be sterilized after it's cleaned. Now, a lot of places are using a third party or external company to sterilize equipment. There are a few issues you would want to consider. You want to ensure the third party processor is following all the best practice and standards that we mentioned in the previous slide, and that your equipment is being handled and processed reprocessed properly. You want to ask the reprocessor about training education of the staff performing the reprocessing. Are they certified through the Canadian Standards Association? or the Medical Device Reprocessing Association of Ontario. You may know them as MDRAO. 
What are their quality control measures? Do they audit their staff? Have they had any incidents that require follow-up? And what is their follow-up process? Also verify, verify the expectations of your end. For example, where are you holding your soiled or dirty equipment for uh, while as a weights pickup? Um, and there's probably pre-cleaning recommendations for your devices that are wait, awaiting pickup. Um, you'll likely have to ensure that any gross soilage is removed prior to being reprocessed. Um, if that gross soilage is removed, it can lead to um, corrosion um, and rendering your instruments useless. So really important to make sure um, that you're following that uh, gross soilage removing and pre-cleaning recommendations. Next, moving on to semi-critical me medical devices. Semi-critical medical devices are those that come into contact with non-intact skin or mucous membranes, but do not penetrate them. These items must be cleaned and then, in, then either high level disinfected or sterilized. As we mentioned previous, sterilization is the preferred method, um, but in long-term care, often there is not a sterilizer. And as a result, you will sometimes process semi-critical medical devices using a high-level disinfectant. For this example, um, we've chosen fingernail clippers. And this is a semi-critical device commonly used in the long-term care retirement home setting. Once the firing fingernail clip clippers are cleaned and disinfected, the clippers must be stored in an area that will prevent them from becoming um, contaminated um before that they are used again so they need to be kept in a clean dry area again it is very important to ensure the fingernail clippers are not contaminated by soiled ob ob uh, items since they are not sterilized but rather high level disinfected although they could be sterilized if you have capacity to do that um so for high level disinfection just to go into the process it is um it is more prevalent in long-term care. So we're gonna focus on this a little bit more. Um, High-level disinfection eliminates vegetative bacteria, um, enveloped and non-enveloped viruses, fungi, and mycobacteria. There are two ways to achieve high-level disinfection, both by a chemical method or by pasteurization. For the purpose of this talk, we're gonna focus on the chemical methods. Um, and this is more suitable for use on instruments, uh, whereas pasteurization is the proper choice for respiratory therapy equipment and anesthetic equipment. Uh, for the, uh, as well, both best methods must be carefully monitored for efficiency, process, documentation, and they need to be audited periodically. So both require all those, um, those things to make sure they're functioning properly. With regards to chemical methods, as we reviewed in the previous question, concentrations must be verified using test strips. Now, moving on to semi-critical medical devices with regards to liquid chemicals used for high-level disinfection. These, the, it, there are a number of important considerations to be taken into account when using a liquid chemical for high-level disinfection. The information about how to use liquid chemicals properly can be found in the manufacturer's instructions. The chemical must have a DIN number, uh, meaning that its use has been validated by Health Canada. For more information on this uh, DIN number, you can visit the Health Canada website as it's a bit outside of the scope of this talk. And before using the chemical, you will ensure it is compatible with your cleaning agents and products since the cleaning always precedes the disinfection. Additionally, you'll need to consult the manufacturer's instructions for the medical advice you plan to high level disinfect to make sure it can tolerate the chemical disinfection and won't ruin the device. When you're ready to use the product, it must be diluted properly if dilution is required following the manufacturer's instructions. And it's also important to remember that the instruments must remain in contact for the medical, with the medical device for the correct amount of time. Afterwards, the device will need to be rinsed once disinfection is completed. The manufacturer's instructions will specify how long this should take place and the length of time. If the process is being done by hand, you need to ensure the container um, used for the disinfection shall be kept covered during use, washed, rinsed, and dried when the solution is changed. Working with these chemicals can be dangerous and staff need to know how to protect themselves and have the correct PPE, personal protective available to protect themselves. Now, with regards to chemical strips, um, chemical test strips are used to confirm that an effective concentration of the active ingredients in your disinfectant is present. Ensuring your high level disinfectant is functioning as expected is a key step in reprocessing semi-critical equipment. The disinfectant needs to be tested every day 
and make sure that it's used according to the manufacturer's instructions. Whenever a new package or bottle of test strips is opened, the test strip should be tested using a positive and negative controls as directed by the manufacturer. So it should say on the packaging, how do you to, um, do that test? The expiry date of the chemicals needs to be monitored of your cleaning solutions and your disinfectant solutions, and it should be disposed as soon as it expires. Even if your test strips say that it has an effective concentration, you really need to focus on that expiry date and make sure that you're discarding accordingly. Finally, moving on to non-critical medical devices um, for low-level disinfection. Non-critical medical devices only touch intact skin and don't directly touch the person at all. Even though these items are lower risk for causing infection, they can still pass on microorganisms. And you'll find that the bulk of the equipment at your long-term care homes probably follows into this classification. So they, although um, you know, the cleaning requirements are lesser for this, or not as, you, know, you still need that low level of disinfection, um, just the bulk of equipment that you have will mean that you really need to pay close attention to this, that this is followed every time after every use as it can um, lead to outbreaks. So for these items, they must be cleaned and then low level disinfected. And note that some products are two, are, have two steps in one. So they might be a cleaner disinfectant all in one and others will be separated. So you'll have a cleaner followed by a disinfectant product. So you need to be aware of the process that used in your home. Some examples of non-critical medical equipment include stethoscopes, basins, bedpans, commodes, wheelchairs, lifts, slings, bladder scanners and environmental equipment like bedside tables. So, you know, that's a lot of information all at once, but I do find that referring back to that table, that Spalding's classification really provides that framework for making that assessment on what your device, the classification it falls under and what you need to do to properly clean and disinfect it or sterilize it or high level disinfect or low level disinfect. So Sarah, I think it's on to you now. Yeah. So let's move on to quality control and reprocessing. So initially at the start of this, uh, I did mention the importance of following uh, guidelines, standards, manufacturer's instructions for use, and the rigor that is involved in ensuring your reprocessing of medical equipment and devices is done uh, to ensure that it is safe and not posing a risk of harm either from infection or from uh, damage that may have incurred during reprocessing. So one of the ways that we want to really ensure that uh, reprocessing uh, systems and uh, activities are being done safely is to think about what is your quality uh, control program in reprocessing. So each long-term care home should have a system in place to provide quality resident care through the provision of clean and disinfected or sterile equipment of medical devices. So really think of following some of these standards as a light that guides the way to ensure you are providing uh, safe care. And quality assurance is what we want to think about, uh, not as, uh, sort of an additional, but part of the overall reprocessing system in place for safety. When we're thinking about quality assurance, uh, administrative controls are an important component of that. So policies and uh, procedures are a piece of that. Overall, the administrative controls will uh, set the tone for the importance of safe reprocessing in your facility, as well as providing a guide to your staff. And the policies and procedures should also have standard operating procedures that detail how staff should be completing the reprocessing work. And they do need to reflect infection prevention and control best practices. Other important administrative controls would include access to and review of current guidelines and standards, access to and review of the manufacturer's instructions for use, 
and a commitment to providing staff responsible for reprocessing with that formal education. In addition, staff using medical devices may also know how to use them safely. So the final administrative control is how you set up your reprocessing space to ensure the best possible flow, decrease the risk of cross-contamination. So all of those activities will fall into the category of administrative controls. So indicator monitoring. Uh, sterilization is monitored by using physical, uh, chemical, and biological indicators. Um, that is sort of beyond the scope or level of detail that we are uh, providing today, but uh, we will have some links in the additional resources to give you more information as this is just an orientation. If you are conducting sterilization within your facility, you will need uh, increased depth of education, training and knowledge. As we discussed earlier, uh, high-level disinfection is monitored by concentration and contact times using chemical uh, test strips to determine whether an effective concentration of the active ingredient is present. And your quality assurance um, measures really should have a continuous improvement focus. Um, Continuous improvement uh, should be a cycle that does include auditing regularly. So it's largely driven by auditing and review of policies and procedures and really staying on top of any changes, either in guidelines and standards or changes within your facility to ensure that you are doing appropriate uh, monitoring. So, Things you need to uh, consider when it comes to components of uh, auditing or monitoring is, does the medical device uh, being uh, reprocessed, is it being done in an area where standards are met? Uh, what devices are being reprocessed? So you do want to know what is going on, where's the area we're doing it, is it set up to meet standards, and you want to check uh, to ensure if you do have uh, single-use devices in your facility, as many organizations will, to ensure that they are not being reused and that they are being disposed of after one use. Are you following manufacturer's instructions for reprocessing? And how are you ensuring reprocessing is being done properly? So this uh, questions to consider, are staff following pop, uh, proper procedures and techniques for reprocessing? Uh, are quality assurance processes systems in place? Uh, what is the documentation that's required? Is it being completed? And uh, how are medical devices being stored once they are reprocessed? So you want them to be stored in a way to prevent any sort of contamination. So it is very clear what has been reprocessed and what has not, and that they will be uh, safe for reuse at the point of use. And then record keeping is also an important part of quality control measures. All of the quality assurance measures we've discussed do need to be documented. Um, so there might be different examples within your facility about how that documentation is taking place. Uh, one example might be something like a log book. So you may include indicator monitoring, um, or you may have a permanent record that does include uh, data such as the identification of what is the equipment or device that was being uh, disinfected, the date and time of clinical procedure uh, for which it was used, concentration and contact time of the disinfection being used. Um, within your documentation, you also want to consider results of each inspection. So as the equipment is being inspected to assure it's working properly before it is being, uh, you know, going down the system of your reprocessing before uh, being either cleaned and disinfected or cleaned and sterilized, uh, you do want to have some documentation that was inspected and continues to be functioning and would be safe uh, for reprocessing and ultimate reuse. 
we would also want to document the results of the testing of the disinfectant. So we mentioned testing, you want to have that documented, as well as the name of the person who was completing the reprocessing activities. So those are key considerations for your documentation. Now, on this slide, and I think this is probably a really important reference one, and you will also find important references in the IPAC orientation uh, checklist for IPAC lease and long-term care that we're mentioning at the beginning of each of these sessions, really to help uh, guide you in your ongoing learning and development. There is a fair level of detail related to reprocessing of medical equipment and devices. So referring to these additional resources to supplement your understanding and guide you through that process may be helpful. So on Public Health Ontario's website, we have a reprocessing homepage. Uh, there are online learning modules for reprocessing in community healthcare settings. Uh, we've made a couple of references to the PIDAC, uh, Provincial Infectious Disease Advisory Committee, best practice uh, document for cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization of medical equipment or devices in all healthcare settings. Uh, on our website, we also do have a reprocessing decision chart that might be a helpful tool for you as well. And the last is uh, the link to the CSA standard uh, that both Tanya and I have mentioned. So one of the things is to ensure that you do have access to appropriate uh, standards. Now we do have uh, time for uh, questions and answers and a bit of discussion. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Tanya and Sara. Um, we will now move to the Q&A part uh, to address some of the questions we have so far, one question only. Um, please continue to enter your questions into the pod if you have not already done uh, uh, that and uh, we will uh, try to address them. Um, so I will go to uh, the first question and so we have so far. And although we, we addressed it, uh, that area um, and uh, Rene uh, asking, I'm wondering if you ex uh, can explain why food care is considered in the category it is. Um, so some background information may be uh, 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 needed there. So Sarah, can you address that? Sure, I can address that. I know, I think that question came in uh, before Tanya, you gave some further description. Yeah. So it may have been already answered, but I think this is a great question because it is one that we do get frequently from long-term care questions about foot care, because when you were uh, looking at the Spalding's classification table and reading the description, it will talk about uh, things like uh, entering into the vascular system. And with foot care, um, there is a fair bit of risk of any sort of nips or cuts that weren't intended to actually uh, occur during delivery of foot care services. So because that risk is uh, higher where it may have not been uh, the intended use to enter into uh, that system, there is a higher probability of doing that with foot care. So that is one reason why foot care equipment is different from uh, fingernail care equipment. So you do see the difference in the foot care equipment requiring sterilization because of that uh, risk with the clinical provision of care. Um, and fingernail equipment does not have uh, that same uh, risk if you're thinking about uh, just clipping of fingernails. And what I would also like to share is within the PIDAC document, there is uh, an appendix that has a table of a lot of commonly used pieces of equipment. So if you're unsure, many pieces of equipment uh, are listed in that table. Foot care specifically, it does give some rationale. And also for finger fingernail uh, care equipment, fingernail clippers, there is a distinction between uh, fingernail uh, clippers that are used on multiple residents compared with ones that are uh, dedicated for an individual resident use with respect to uh, reprocessing. So for extra details, that document I think is uh, helpful. 
And I'm glad you asked that because that is a commonly asked question we get. So thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and the next one is, is it possible to perform sterilization of equipment within a long-term care home? Um, Tanya, if you can uh, address that. No, I mean, I mean, it is possible if you do have a medical de device reprocessing area facility, um, if you have an autoclave or sterilizer, then you could do that. There's certainly capacity, like some places could have that, but I find the bulk of long-term care homes do not have that um, space available to them. So really mostly at the long-term care of uh, homes, we do see that it's high level disinfection really is the method that is used most often. So a lot of times if sterilization is required, it would have to go to a third party root processor to be taken away and brought back sterile, but you may be responsible for cleaning it at your site, but they will take it away, sterilize it and bring it back to your facility. So it isn't impossible, but I do find that likely um, you will have to employ a third party root processor um, to help you with that your sterilization needs. Thanks. And if I can add to that, I think that's uh, great. That was, uh, I think it does relate to one of the earlier slides that did have a quote from PIDAC. And just to highlight that the expectations for uh, any kind of reprocessing really are to ensure that the equipment is equally safe for the following care recipient. So there is not the additional risk of infection because something was not plain disinfected or sterilized properly, and also it's functioning properly. So those principles are entirely uh, applicable regardless of where reprocessing activities are taking place. And sterilization is a more involved type of reprocessing. So there might be operational considerations where it's not uh, feasible or uh, would not be easy for many facilities to conduct that in-house with their either design, the staff education, the physical space, or it might not be practical for the specifics of the equipment you're being used, uh, that's being used. So it, the standards don't change no matter where the care is being provided. That would be true for home care in the community where equipment needed to be sterile. It's true for long-term care in hospital, uh, but there are some practical considerations about uh, how different kinds of organizations can meet that. And very often uh, sterilization will not be done in long-term care uh, just for some of those practical reasons. And I think that does sort of connect into the slide about considering uh, when you're looking at your equipment, if single-use disposable equipment will be used, if it's available for the activities you're doing, or if you will be uh, doing reprocessing of equipment that requires sterilization. Uh, if you do not currently have something uh, system and processes set up that is more involved. So before making those decisions or contributing to those discussions, as you're starting to learn about uh, the role of the IPAC lead, that might be an area where you would want to connect with some of those additional resources or reach out for assistance from some of your partners and health units and IPAC hubs, Public Health Ontario resources or others. Yeah, thank you uh, for, for answers and additions. And I would emphasize also on uh, the need for trained staff uh, who is responsible for, for reprocessing. Yeah, thank you. And uh, let's uh, move on. And uh, the next one is in uh, long-term care, we use uh, iPads for point of care documentation and we are struggling how to best disinfect as they get damaged with Oxivir wipes. Um, yeah, uh, Sarah or Tanya, anyone? Yeah, I think uh, it's important to make sure that your cleaning products would be uh, compatible with the electronic devices. There certainly are some cleaning products that are uh, a little more gentle on your electronic devices as well. Um, so you could look, reach out to manufacturers to make sure you know what is compatible and will extend the use without corroding screens. Also making sure that those wipes are not overly saturated. So um, sometimes as you get to the bottom of the wipes container, they're overly wet. So uh, making sure those are not employed on your devices. Um, there also are covers that you can use uh, robust for healthcare settings to protect your electronic devices so that they can be wiped and used 
um, and not applied directly to the screen. So that's another consideration to employ some protective coverings, protective cases for your iPads or your iPhones or whatever um, you're using uh, on, your, on your floors to do your audits and your, your work. So those are a couple of considerations. I don't know if um, there's probably others, Sarah, did you have to add to that or? Yeah, I was just going to uh, comment that uh, when it comes to electronic equipment and devices, there can be a variety of uses. We know care is becoming more electronic. So there could be things that are used for documentation that are not medical equipment or devices that are used for the care of your residents. And there can be other electronic equipment that is directly involved in care. Um, so in the last, the previous session last week for environmental cleaning, where we were talking about the role of the environment in transmission, there's also a little bit of information related to uh, cleaning and disinfecting some of those often trickier uh, to clean and disinfect electronic devices that does link to that uh, PIDAC document around environmental uh, cleaning that does have some considerations. So you may have electronic equipment uh, that is directly involved in care, and you may have other equipment that's in your environment. If it is going to be equipment in the clinical environment before you bring it in, you do want to have mechanisms to ensure it can be cleaned and disinfected. That is likely going to be your low-level disinfection, and then it will be working about if it can be covered, protected, compatibility of product with devices, and also that users are aware of how to do that. Uh, so it can be damage for the devices. And also if there are any personal protective equipment like gloves that are required for handling your disinfectant products. So this uh, topic, it could be you have electronic clinical equipment that is directly involved in care, and it could be a variety of equipment, whether it's computers on wheels, IPAC for auditing, that's entering into the clinical environment. And for those pieces of equipment, more details can also be found in the uh, provincial uh, PIDAC document for environmental cleaning. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for thorough um, answer. And I have three um, next questions about all of them. I can combine into one, uh, clarifying more about uh, nail clippers and um, how to arrange a, a process, a reprocessing and um, uh, the, the food care related other nail clippers and others and the level of classification and uh, the, the resources we, we mentioned earlier, which I can tell right away that it will be available uh, in the presentation we will share and put on our website. The links will be there. And in, in the recording, we will highlight that as well. So um, if we can combine all of this, it's one more time about uh, nail clippers. Uh, if uh, we can address that, um, Tanya, maybe you can uh, combine all in, in one answer. Sure. So I think Sarah gave a pretty um, thorough answer. So I'll just try and add a little bit to what she previously said. But we know that that foot care equipment as per PIDAC and as Sarah mentioned, the risk of nips and cuts to the skin does follow um, under devices that need to be sterilized. So you'll have to arrange for cleaning at the site that removing any gross contamination or blood or body fluid at the site. Have it stored somewhere in your facility for pickup. As, as Sarah mentioned, it's, a, it's likely that you will have to employ a third party repro processor who will pick up those devices, take them away, clean and, and sterilize them and bring them back to you in appropriate packaging. With regards to fingernail clippers, uh, you will probably likely be able to process, reprocess that at your facility using a high level disinfection as per the PIDAC uh, and the Spalding classifications uh, that we mentioned earlier. Uh, additionally, some facilities do dedicate them to the residents, still requires that cleaning and disinfection, but just eliminates additional risk from sharing um, any dev uh, those devices with uh, more than one client or resident. So um, that does, you know, a lot of a lot of places have gone that way with dedicating the clippers to the individual resident, um, just to eliminate those uh, any risk of cross contamination with other residents clients. Sarah, did you have anything to add? I know you gave a pretty thorough answer. So I was just trying to recap and expand, but mm -hmm. I think I didn't know yeah. if you had anything further. <laughs> The wait, only wait, wait. additional uh, thing, sorry, uh, boys, the only additional thing uh, I would consider is 
you want to ensure all of the uh, equipment and devices being used are safe for the people using them and the recipient's care. And that does include any contracted or outsourced providers. So many organizations will have uh, professionals for foot care coming in or entering the home and bringing in their equipment. And that may not be their staff, but the facility does have responsibility to ensure that standards are being met and appropriate safe equipment is being used. So that would be an additional consideration if you do have external providers. Uh, how will your uh, facility ensure that some of these standards are being met? And there can be different ways people might want to uh, have things included uh, in their policies and procedures. Uh, related to quality assurance for external providers as well. Thank you. Um, and the last question I'll take, um, uh, th there are devices that will clean those mentioned electronic devices through UV. Any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, so again, UV disinfection is a great method to use, but just remembering that that's in addition to your cleaning and disinfection, it's that extra step. The UV technology, while wonderful, and has been employed across many facilities that I've you know, been a party to, um, well, it doesn't uh, invalidate the need to cleaning because that UV, if there is gross soil and contamination, won't be able to work effectively. So it does need that cleaning and disinfection and is an additional layer that can serve on top to um, to help to you know reduce reduce any uh, contamination, especially for your high touch items, your electronics and other small items that are really high touch, just provides that additional layer. So I don't know if anyone else had a further to add to that. Just to consider again, uh, I know I've mentioned this many times during this session, uh, but it is one of the key messages around thinking about what are those principles for uh, how do you safely reprocess? One of the considerations, we have those uh, standards and guidelines, but looking at the manufacturer's instructions for use, and when it comes to newer technologies, electronic equipment, you do want to make sure there are compatibility, and if the device is going to be uh, using an adjunct or uh, newer technology for disinfection, the same way you would want to look for compatibility with a liquid product, you want to make sure it's compatible. So you're looking at the manufacturer's instructions for use, both for the uh, piece of equipment being disinfected, as well as for the UV technology being involved in uh, disinfection. So you do need to do a bit of uh, research. Thank you. And um, as we wrap up uh, today's webinar, I would like to thank Tanya and Sarah for presenting one more time and answering these questions. You can expect to receive the brief anonymous survey for today's session. Please try to complete this to help us improve our future programming. Um, and, uh, you have now um, some questions, uh, polling questions, the last one in front of your screen. And lastly, uh, to access past presentations, as mentioned, two already out there, uh, in our uh, website, when you go to the events uh, section of the website, you will be able to see there. Uh, please visit uh, Public Health Ontario website for other educational uh, events and programs and presentations. And uh, uh, thank you very much and have a wonderful Friday and uh, weekend.